Hey, good morning, Northeast. We are so thankful that you decided to join us today on this Easter Sunday. Let's read really quickly from Matthew chapter 28, verse number five. It says, but the angel said to the women, that's Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. See, I have told you. So this is the reason that we gather on this Easter Sunday and every other Sunday, because we have victory in Jesus. And so if you're joining us for the very first time, you might hear us make some weird statements about the blood of Christ and the body of Christ and its brokenness. Listen, this is all we mean by that. We believe as Christians that Jesus Christ is the son of God, that he came down as flesh and lived among us, that he lived a perfect life, died a sinner's death on the cross, taking our blame before the father that he was buried in a borrowed tomb and three days later by the power of God was raised back to life. And here's the good news that we want everyone to hear today, that if anyone would believe in him, that he was who he said he was, that he is alive and well even today, that they too would never die but have everlasting life just by our belief, not by our works. That's good news today, and that's why we sing. So we invite you to sing these songs, celebrate with us. If you know these words, sing them along. They'll be on your screen. And if you don't, would you just think about these words? Would you allow them to just sit in your mind and your heart today? Come on, let's pray together. Father, we love you. God, we are thankful that the tomb is empty today. God, that all the promises you set in motion, God, that they all came to pass. Lord, that you are a keeper of your word. So today we celebrate in our trust in you. God, our trust that we are, we are safe. God, we are secure. Uh, God, in the, in the deeds of Christ and not our own. Lord, we love you and we bless you. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And everyone said, amen. Come on, let's sing together. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. All my fears. Break at the weight of your glory. 
I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I breathe. I have a future. My eyes are open. It's when you call my name. Death could not hold you, the veil torn before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave, the heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you Hey Northeast, good morning and happy Easter. We are so excited to get to join with you this morning in the beautiful name of Jesus we just sang about. We know that we're distant this morning, but that's not going to stop us from celebrating the resurrection of our King. The grave couldn't hold him down and no pandemic is going to stop us from celebrating that. If this is your first time joining us online, welcome. We're really glad that you're here. On the right side of your screen, you can check out some resources. We would love for you to introduce yourself in the chat and check out the area where you can read your Bible or take notes or even request prayer. If you're checking out church for the first time this morning, or maybe you're just checking out what Easter is all about, no matter what your situation is, we want you to know this. You belong here. Our God is a God of perfect love, and that love is unchanging and unshakable. No matter what your past mistakes are or your doubts have been, God loves you beyond all of that. This morning, at the end of the message, you're going to have an opportunity to pray and make a decision that is going to be life-changing for all eternity. Our prayer this morning is that you would answer that call from God. Join me as we pray to prepare our hearts for that this morning. God, thank you so much that we get to celebrate this morning hope in a world that seems hopeless at times. God, thank you that we don't need anything beyond what you've already provided for us. 
God, thank you for a love that's unshakable and unchanging, even when we fail. God, we pray this morning that we would recognize your love, that we would feel your love, and that we would respond to your word, that we would respond to your calling on our life. God, we love you so much. Thanks for the opportunity to be together this morning and celebrate you. God, we pray that you're honored in that. We love you. Amen. Let's face it, this isn't exactly what any of us expected. When we set out this year, we set out with resolutions, with plans, with grand intentions. There were things to do, places to go, things to see. Now, instead of planning trips to the coast, we're strategizing visits to the store. And who would have thought we'd been so excited to find toilet paper? This definitely isn't what any of us expected. Who of us ever thought we'd find ourselves here? Schools closed, businesses shuttered, streets bare. Suddenly we're all keenly aware of how fragile everything really is. Because overnight everything has changed. From open to closed from social to distant, from business as usual to everything virtual, even Easter. Let's face it, this is not what we expected. But for all the strange new realities that we're facing in this season, the strangest thing of all, I think, is the solution. They tell us that to help people, we have to avoid them that the best way to fight against this thing is by retreating away from each other, and that the best hope for saving lives is if we all will lay everything down. It seems like a paradox, doesn't it? It certainly sounds completely upside down, and it grates against everything in us because our natures are wired to think about what we want. And if I'm being honest, what I want right now is to go to my favorite restaurant, what I want right now is a date night. What I want right now is to go to the gym or, or to go see a movie. What we want is to do what we want, not lay it down. But what if I told you that this paradox, the, the paradox of this pandemic, that we'd find life by laying it down. What if I told you that this isn't just the key to saving lives here and now, but it's also the answer to finding the life that we had always hoped for. What if I told you that the life we really yearn for, a life free from the fears and the aches and the pains of everything that we're experiencing here, what if I told you it's not found in what we can take up and what we can hold on to, but rather it's found in laying our lives down? See, it seems to me this is such a strange thing for us to consider, such a new thing for us to consider, but it's the very thing that Jesus said. And when he first said it, he left a lot of people confused. This paradox, but perhaps you and I in this season have a unique advantage to understand Jesus' words in a whole new way. When Jesus spoke about the paradox of life and finding the life we really hope for, he left us a paradox. And these words are found from Jesus in the New Testament book of Mark, Mark chapter 8. Not long before Jesus would enter Jerusalem and go to the cross, he would speak these words. And these are his words. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. And he, Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, but turning and seeing his disciples, he, Jesus, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. 
And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his soul? For what can a man gain in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with holy angels. So Jesus in this moment is, is preparing for the cross. He, he's preparing for this moment. And so he willingly tells his disciples exactly what's going to happen. Mark tells us he speaks plainly in this so no one would misunderstand. The scriptures would tell us that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Jesus came wrapped in flesh to walk where we walk, but with one key difference. Jesus walked life perfectly. He walked it out perfectly. Jesus walked in a way that I could never walk. I could never boast in being flawless. And yet Jesus came and he lived a perfect life that he might go to the cross and exchange his life for mine, his righteousness for my unrighteousness. This is what the gospels tell us. And Jesus knows this. Jesus knows where he is going and he wants the disciples to understand what he is doing. And so he tells them plainly, verse 31 that he will suffer many things, he will be rejected, he will be killed, and then he will rise again. But in the midst of this moment, Peter does something surprising. Peter, the disciple, turns to his rabbi, his teacher, and Peter begins to rebuke him, meaning that Peter is is pushing back against Jesus. Like, how can this be? You're, You're talking crazy talk. And he begins to rebuke Jesus in this moment because Peter, maybe like you, can't wrap his mind around it. How can it be that you're going to die and rise again? This seems impossible, right? I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. There's no category for that. We've certainly never seen that. And how on earth could science ever prove that someone could die and rise again? So Peter pushes back because it seems like nonsense. And then Jesus, in turn, pushes back against Peter. He responds to him in verse 33, you are not setting your mind on the things of God. Peter, what you have in focus is things here in this earth, and you can't even fathom the life that God is trying to give you. And so Jesus calls the rest around him, seeing the rest, he calls them and he begins to speak. In verse 34, he says this paradoxical thing. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will save it. If anyone. Now now we read that and we're like, what are you talking about, Jesus? Whoever would would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will, will save it. Like, what on earth does that mean? Stop speaking in riddles. And it's ironic that Jesus is saying something that sounds like a riddle when earlier Mark tells us that he's, for the first time, speaking plainly, right? Letting everything show. But it doesn't seem to make sense, not from our vantage point. But the term that Jesus uses here for save, I think, can unlock for us the meaning of what Jesus is saying. The term that Jesus uses here to save literally means rescue, So Jesus is saying, hey, whoever would try to rescue his life will lose it. Whoever would lose his life or lay it down would rescue it. When I was a kid, my father almost drowned, which is crazy to think because my father is such a strong man. He was such a strong swimmer, and water was his thing. That was like his domain. So to think of my father almost drowning almost blows my mind. I can't fathom it. But one day on a trip at the Pacific, he took a swim and he jumped into the ocean and began swimming out, except he got caught in a riptide and the riptide started pulling him out to sea. 
And as strong as a swimmer as my father was, he could not fight against it. And the more he fought, the more tired he became. And, and the more he got sucked out to sea, the more he fought and the more tired he became. And this cycle just kept going. And soon my father found himself in deep trouble, beginning to drown. The thing that they tell us about water rescue, one of the number one rules about water rescue is that you can't rescue someone who doesn't want to be rescued. And you can't rescue that person unless they're willing to let you and they're willing to give up control. You see, if someone's trying to rescue themselves, if someone's trying to do it on their own strength, if they're thrashing about, or if they try to rescue themselves by pulling themselves up on top of their rescuer, they will drown you both. And so the number one rule of water rescue is that you can't rescue someone who isn't willing to be rescued and who isn't willing to give you control. But when that person rests in your arms, when that person surrenders to your strength and allows you to rescue them and just let's go, then the rescuer can pull them in. My father was rescued that day by someone else. And he allowed himself to be rescued by someone who had the strength to rescue him. And he was rescued because he gave up control. He rested in someone else's strength and they pulled him out of the rip current and up to the shore. I think Jesus' words here become clearer and clearer to us in light of that. Jesus says, whoever would rescue himself would lose his life. Whoever would lay his life down, who would rest and surrender to him, would actually find rescue. See, what's true of water rescue is true of our rescue too, and that's Jesus' intent, and that's Jesus' point that whoever would try to rescue himself will lose his life, but whoever surrenders to his rescue will find life. It's the paradox of this pandemic that the way to save lives is by laying something down, by laying our lives aside. Jesus is saying, if we go it alone, we won't make it. And the best thing for us is the most counterintuitive thing to us, to stop trying on our own. That's Jesus' message. But what's at stake from Jesus' perspective isn't our physical health, it's our spiritual health. What's at stake from Jesus' perspective is our soul. That's why he says, what does it profit a man? Verse 36, what does it profit a man if he would gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? What does it profit us to try to hold on to all of these things, to try to hold on to possessions, to try to hold on to our careers, only in the end to lose the life that we were really wanting in the first place, a life free of fear and worry and all the angst and hurts and the cares that drag us down. Jesus is saying, what does it profit a man if you try to hold on to all these things, but in the end you lose? And so he says, surrender to my rescue and you'll find the life that you're really after. See, what what Jesus is offering here is the life that's truly life. He said in John 10 that he came to bring us life and life abundantly. Jesus came to offer us so much more than the trappings of this life, so much more than the, the simple things that we often pine for here. Jesus is pointing to a hope that can never fade and will never fail. It's fascinating to me that Peter, the very one that Jesus had to rebuke because he was thinking from an earthly perspective, Peter would go on and later figure this out. And Peter then would write these words in the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3. He'd write this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. In this we rejoice. What do we rejoice? In this 
living hope that's been secured through the resurrection of Jesus. A living hope that Peter says cannot be taken. He says we have this living hope in Jesus because Jesus died on our behalf, was buried and resurrected three days later, just as he said, exchanging his perfect life for the debt that we owed, the debt of our imperfect lives, the debt of our sin. And because Jesus was willing to go to the cross on our behalf, he secured for us something that we could never secure based on our own work or our own merit. Jesus secured for us a living hope and the hope of heaven, not just freedom and forgiveness from sin here in this life, but the hope of being with him in the next, the hope of eternity, the hope of heaven. And Peter says that this hope is imperishable, it's undefiled, it's unfading. We would say it is unshakable. This hope is unshakable. It cannot be taken from us. It doesn't rise or fall with the markets when they fluctuate. There's no expiration date on the hope of heaven. And notice what Peter says. He says it comes not because of our work, but he says this, it comes because of God's great mercy, according to his great mercy mercy. Meaning not because you were able to rescue yourself, but because God in his loving kindness was willing to rescue you. That is the basis for our hope. He is offering us an unshakable assurance that because of Jesus' work, our life can be more than the sum of these broken parts. Think about this for a moment. Your life can be more than the sum of all of these broken parts. Your life is more than a career that someday will fade into retirement. Your life is more than some plaque on the wall or some achievement from college or your early years that you will later have to explain to your grandchildren why that was so significant. Your life is more than social distancing. It's more than a volatile market. Your life is more than a struggling marriage or no marriage at all. Your life is is so much more than these simple, broken things. Why? Because when we place our faith in Jesus, we have an unshakable hope and the hope of heaven free from all these things that rise or fall or fail. We have a living hope because God has offered us rescue. And in Jesus, we have this unshakable hope of heaven. Isn't that good news? This is the good news of the gospel. It's the good news of what Peter discovered, and it's the good news of what Jesus is trying to help us understand. See, the paradox of the pandemic is also the paradox of the gospel, that we find this life when we're willing to lay ours down. Because he who would rescue himself will lose his life, but he who would seek God's rescue will find the life he's always wanted. Oh, the world will tell us that the key to life is in what we possess. The the world will tell us to, to have more, to do more, to travel more, to own more, to purchase more, to possess more. But the reality is that can't satisfy the deepest part of our souls. And think of it, we're all realizing it right now more than ever before in our lives. All of those things are being restricted from us. And we're recognizing now that life must be more than the sum of all of these parts. And Jesus is saying he's offering us something that can last, something unshakable, something that can truly satisfy. So many of the decisions that we're making right now in this life, in this country, are decisions made out of the fear of death. Jesus is inviting you to stop living in the fear of death and to start living in the hope of heaven, the unshakable hope that he secured for you through his resurrection, that by his life he would prove that there is life yet for you when you trust in his rescue. So how? How do we do this and what does it look like? It means we got to stop swimming in our own strength. It means that we have to depend on Jesus and his strength to rescue us. 
The Bible says very clearly that all we must do is confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and place our faith in him that God raised him from the dead to secure this hope for us. And when we do that, God is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to secure for us the hope of heaven with him. That's it. We confess and we place our faith. That's what it means to surrender our life to him. That's what it means to lay our lives down. That's what it means to accept God's rescue. So perhaps you're here today and for the very first time you're realizing you've been swimming in your own strength. Would you today willingly lay your life down? And would you today take up the rescue that God is offering? A life that is truly life. And I want to invite you right now where you are to pray with me as we close. God sees where you are. God hears your heart. But would you be willing today to embrace his rescue by praying along with me as we close? If you don't know what that looks like, if you don't have the words, I want to invite you just to pray these words right where you are with me right now. Father God, we confess that we've tried to make it on our own. And Father, I confess I have trusted in so many other things. But in this season, Father, you're helping me see that all of those things will fail and fade. And so right now and right here, Father, I place my trust in you and I ask for your rescue. Father, would you Forgive me of my sin. Would you change me from the inside out? Father, would you give me the life that is truly life? I turn to you. I place my trust in you. And I do it in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer today, I'm so glad. I'd love nothing more than to invite you to tell us that you prayed that prayer. And and here's why. Because we have a gift for you to help you take your first steps of faith. And so right now on the screen, you can either click the button that you made a decision or, or scan the QR code. That will take you to a place where you can tell us that you made this decision. Again, because we have a gift for you. We want to help you take your first steps of faith. Jesus said it himself in Mark chapter 8 that, man, whoever is willing to stand up, whoever is willing to to associate with the Son of God, then, man, he will remember us. And whoever is embarrassed of that, man, let's not be embarrassed of that. Let's embrace the life that is truly life. So if you prayed that prayer today, would you click over? Would you tell us so that we can send you a resource to help you take your first steps of faith? And now let's remember the hope that we have and let's continue to worship together because God has given us this anchor for our soul, an anchor that cannot be taken. Jesus, the hope of heaven. Father, we thank you for that hope and we continue to worship you now in light of that hope. Thank you for your rescue, we pray in Jesus' name.
Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. If you did place your faith in Jesus Christ today, we have a gift for you to help you take your first steps of faith. There's still time for you to reach out to us. Click on the banner or click on the prayer link and let us know how we can follow up with you. Also, if you're experiencing difficulty right now, we would love to come around you in prayer. Use that prayer link to reach out to us so that we can come alongside of you. And if perhaps in this season you've lost work or you're in need, we want to know that too. Northeast cares. So please use the prayer link. Let us know how we can come around you. We would love to labor with you in this season together. Parents and kids, hold on. You don't want to go anywhere just yet. The Northeast Kids Easter program is right around the corner. And also, if your family is anything like ours, we love to get an Easter picture together. So keep an eye on the screens and grab a selfie together as a family, as a part of your Easter experience. Post that online, tag us in it on Facebook or Instagram, and let us know that you joined us this Easter. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Stay tuned for our kids program. You do not want to miss the special that we have in store for you today.